Hi, I'm Leonard Diggins, and I am the host of this series called What Sex Got to Do With It. Uh, and the my guest is, or my fellow guest is, <laughs> is Heather Remoff, the author. Uh, and the subtitle of the series? Um, Darwin, Love, Lust, and the Anthropocene. Yes, yes, quite the mouthful, you know, and I could introduce the series a whole lot more, but what would be the point? He, let's just get right into it, and unlike um, most series where you start at the very beginning, we're going to start at the end on this one, starting with the acknowledgments. And so, Heather, first off, I'm going to give you an opportunity, I mean, if there was any one or any people that you left out of the acknowledgments that you wish were in, Here's your chance. I, I don't. I don't think so. Okay. I, yeah, well, I, well, people like you, people who I met after the book was in place. So, you know. I, you know. I wish you were in the acknowledgments. Yeah. So I've, I've met other people since the book was written that have been very helpful so to if me. If only could appear into the future. Well, hopefully, you know, yeah. maybe that'll be something <laughs> but, that we can. But, uh, yeah. So yes, yeah, so, and uh, you know, I have other people who've been very helpful to me since the book was published. Great, great, great. And, you know, I can kind of relate in, in, to your graduate school experience. I mean, even though I didn't go to grad school myself, I mean, uh, you went later. I mean, I kind of, to a certain extent, I spent a, a lot of time in a graduate school setting because I worked in the Lewington lab as a tech for a long time. And I really appreciate it. It seemed like it was kind of the environment that you had at Rutgers. Mm -hmm. it, uh, 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 it isn't so much that it was interdisciplinary as much as it was that it brought in a, a lot of people from different disciplines. So in that sense, it was interdisciplinary, but it wasn't like it was a couple of labs from different disciplines that were connected. It was more that Richard Lewington I mean, attracted a lot of different people. And so, so my, my, my period of time there was, was really a wonderful period of time. I mean, and, and, and so uh, you mentioned Lionel and, and Robin. I mean, they were like the directors there? They were at Rutgers. They were yeah. my mentors. I feel so lucky. I was a very naive um, when I was younger. I guess in some ways I still am. I just didn't realize there were things I couldn't do. Right. And, um, you know, I did the standard thing of getting my undergraduate degree, but that was in sociology. And... You know, the first thing I learned in sociology, they said, my first professor said, the underlying premise of sociology is that all behavior is learned. I did not believe that. I'd grown up around all kinds of animals. I knew that all behavior was not learned. Within different breeds of sheep or pigs or dogs, behavior, you could predict it based on the breed. But I went through three and a half years of undergraduate school pretending I believed that because I wanted to get good grades. And then I did the standard thing, got married, had kids, etc. And I was living in Kansas City. And a friend started lending me books um, written by an author who was talking about the evolution of behavior. And I thought, wow, Robert Hartree. Maybe the field of sociology is ready for me now. And so the um, University of Kansas City the University of Missouri at Kansas City was a short drive for me. So I enrolled f for a master's in um, sociology, thinking, oh, finally, sociology is ready to look at behavior, the link between behavior and biology. And at my first graduate level class at UMKC, the professor said, now the underlying premise of sociology is that all behavior is learned. I thought, oh no, they're still not ready for me, but they were. That was a night school, and I really didn't you know, have a lot of connection with my fellow students and professors. But that department allowed me to do my master's thesis on the relationship between a woman's rank in an all-female hierarchy and her testosterone levels. And the endocrinologist, we drew blood to test it. The endocrinologist I worked with was stunned. I was expecting a, a, a positive correlation. I had three groups of women, and I got perfect negative correlation in two of the groups and a strong negative correlation in the third. So it was that research that Lionel Tiger and Robin Fox were interested in at Rutgers. And again, I never wanted to be an academic. I always wanted to be a writer. 
the only time I, the time, both times for my master's and my, my PhD, I went back to school when there were questions I wanted to answer, was curious about, and I couldn't find the answers in books. And so once I had my master's thesis, I was really suddenly excited wow, there is a link between biology and behavior. And then I read a book um, by Lionel Tiger and Robin Fox, The Imperial Animal. And they were also talking about the link between biology and behavior. It was in the early days of sociobiology. So I thought, oh, I want to study under those two men because I, I, I have questions I want answered. And so I applied to Rutgers and based on my master's thesis. I, I think that they, they felt I was a good fit for the program because it was the early days of sociobiology. And, you know, I, I think one reason I connect with you, Len, and that you connected with my book is because you have some background in, in population genetics. And so you sort of get the kinds of things that drive my curiosity. Yes, yes, yes. And, and uh, um, the Lewington lab was right underneath the E.O. Wilson lab, you know, at the Museum of Comparative Zoology. And as you know, E.O. Wilson was a big sociobiology uh, 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 researcher. And there's certainly some tension between, <laughs> between the, the labs. We, but, but I hear where you're, you're coming from. And certainly there is, is that, that, that connection. You know, and, and I thank you for that history, because I was interested in understanding how you got into uh, a, a graduate program and, and, and um, the motive for it. And, and, and I can certainly relate to the desire to want to learn things and, and answer questions, I mean, um, figure out stuff. You know, and a research environment is really a great um, place for doing that. Well, one of the, outs the outside member of my dissertation committee was Robert Trivers, who at that time was at Harvard. Uh -huh. And uh, when I read a paper that he'd written on sexual selection in lizards, I thought, oh, oh, this man gets it. I didn't realize these were important people. Because <laughs> again, I was naive. And I hopped in my little VW bug and drove from New Jersey up to um, Cambridge to ask Robert Trivers if he'd be the outside member on my dissertation committee. And at that point, he showed me through the labs, E.O. Wilson's lab and yeah. so forth, that showed me the ants. But again, I didn't know to be excited about that. Now, I have to say that I really credit Bob Trivers with doing the research that was foundational to the whole um, discipline of what is now called um, evolutionary psychology, but that back then was called um, sociobiology. Yeah, uh -huh. and, and his research is really foundational to that field. And so I was very, very lucky yeah. uh, that he agreed to do that. Right. And he was very, he's more, he more than anyone has influenced the way I think about the world. Interesting. So yeah, that was actually one other person I wanted to talk about because you mentioned that he was the first person that made you aware of our very human talent for self-deception and deceit. Mm -hmm. So that's a that's an intense statement, and you know? uh, so so um, can you tell me more? Of the, so what is it? I hardly know how the question to ask here. And, um, what is this talent that we have for self-deception and self deceit? Well, it, 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 it's a talent that's a bit of a double-edged sword. Yeah. It's a talent that's based in our language ability. Yeah. And um, of all the species that have ever evolved on this planet, there's only one that has symbolic communication, and that's humans. That's language. All species communicate. I happen to think that plants even communicate. But all species have systems of communication. But only humans have language. And it, it's through language that, that we employ self-deception and deceit. Okay. I mean, that is the source of our uh, dubious ability to do that. Um, because we're very good at lying to ourselves, convincing ourselves of the purity of our own motives. Right. And then once we believe that, we're very, very good at convincing other people. And, and, and Bob Trivers actually has written several books in which he deals with that, but it was in personal conversation that he first made me aware of the concept. That's interesting. So, so, yeah. I, so I mean, having read your book, I mean, I know what role language is going to play. Mm -hmm. and, uh, 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 and so, so his conclusion 
about humans being very good at self-deception and deceit is based on language. I, I don't think he made it that language is central, a part of it as I do. Okay. I've come to understand the importance of language only since, I mean, I've always known language is important. Even when I was in graduate right. school, there was speculation. Well, what drove the evolution of human language and right. you know you know there's all kind all kinds of reasons that right. are given but it was not until i was here in arlington i moved here in 2008 and as i mentioned i, I had a 20-year period where i be kind of got lost in the field mm. of economic activism and it was only when i moved up here that my interest in evolutionary theory came roaring back mm. because of Harvard, MIT, the Broad Institute, right. Radcliffe, all these wonderful lectures that are made right. available to us, to the public. Right. And suddenly I was so excited. And I have a friend who's a linguist. Right. And when she came to visit me from California, she said, oh, let's have a salon. We'll, we'll, have, we'll get a bunch of people and we'll talk about the evolution of language. She gave me a bunch of books to read prior to doing that. And suddenly... I'm seeing language is so central to everything that is human. Right. But for Trivers, I mean, what was he basing the statement that humans are good at self I, I, I think he was just aware that that's how humans behaved. Gotcha. I, 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 you know, he just, I think he saw, I, I think he def, described it behaviorally mm -hmm. and could see how it worked in terms of getting genes passed on. He definitely saw its importance in terms of evolutionary success, uh, reproductive success, right. you know, getting your genes into the genes of the, the next um, generation. Right. And since men and women, if you're looking at it biologically, might have competing uh, ways to get to the same conclusion of getting their genes into the gene pool of the next generation, self-deception and deceit become important in, important in that as well. So I, I think that was more his basis of gotcha. it. Gotcha, gotcha. So, you know, moving along in the acknowledgements, I mean, you mentioned uh, James Tyrone Lane. He, uh, you don't say much, you know, uh, you say he understands creative passion, and it's been a part of my life since he was six and I was 46. Yeah. <laughs> you don't say much at all, but, but I'm intrigued, and I'll tell you why. First off, you don't say much. And secondly, we, we share a similar, well, we share the, the identical middle name. So now, oh. like, so now there's that, that connection to me. So now it's kind of like, do you care to say more? Well, you know, the reason I don't say more is because I want him to tell his own story. Okay. Right. But, but James, I, I'm, I'm going to say more now because he's coming to Boston. This is going to make me cry. Oh, wow. He, I love him so much. He's coming to Boston next week because he has a major role in the the uh, musical Ain't Too Proud, oh, yeah. The Temptation Show, and, uh -huh. and my family and I will be going in to see him perform. Oh, wow. But also I'll be meeting up with him, you know, uh -huh. otherwise. But, yeah, he was, he was the most wonderful <laughs> kid. I lived in Center City, right. Philadelphia. And he was friend. He went to the magnet school. There was a magnet yeah. elementary school just around the corner from me, and it was school of performing arts, which yeah. is what he wanted to do. And he went to that school, but he played with a little boy who lived next door to me. And one day I hear knock, knock, knock on the door, <laughs> and um, there are these two little kids, and they said, "Do you have some string and some paper cups?" because we want to make a telephone. I, I was all in. <laughs> okay. So next thing, these two little guys are there with paper cups and string, and they're talking to each other, and they're talking to me. And James and I have been talking to each other ever since. He, he, he is, he, he's just a, an important person, an, a, an important person in my life. And although I was drawn to him because he was so adorably cute. Right. There was also some recognition, uh, intellectual. We, we made uh, an intellectual, a very, very strong intellectual connection. I don't know how else to describe it. I sort of recognized him as a kindred spirit. So even though I was maternal with him and protective of right. him, we kind of connected at an intellectual and friendship level. One day we were riding bikes on Penn's Landing and he said to me, 
together. Don't you think we're funny friends? I said, I don't know. Why? And he said, well, you know, I'm a boy and you're a girl. So don't you think we're funny friends? I said, well, I don't know, not really. He said, well, you know, you're white and I'm black and I'm young and you're old. <laughs> Don't you think we're funny friends? I said, well, I guess when you look at it that way, we are funny friends. But the main thing is we're friends. Yeah. And we were and we always have been. Well, that's know? great. That's, yeah. That's great. Yeah. yeah. Well, there's something about the age difference to me that made me key in on it because we, you know, a, a friend of mine who actually um, uh, worked at the... Um, it was a museum of comparative zoology, and, and he was very much into crocodiles. I mean, and so he and, and his wife had a daughter, you know, and so so I started babysitting her from the time that she was two months old. I mean, uh, and I babysit her at least like once a week. I mean, mm -hmm. and so we developed a really good relationship, you know, and, and so so. Me, something about it made me think, oh, I wonder if it's kind of a similar relationship. I mean, and it was, even though it wasn't babysitting because he was yeah. older, I mean, it's yeah. still that kind of like, I imagine yeah. kind of regular interaction where. Yeah, and when, you know, even when my late husband yeah. and I moved from Philadelphia, you know, to, to a rural area of Pennsylvania, we stayed in touch and he would come visit and when he was in college. And then he, you know, once he began auditioning for shows in New York, I knew he wasn't going to finish college because he's very talented. Right. And uh, so he's, he, but he's, you know, he's, he's, he's very successful Broadway performer. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Well, I'm happy I asked. And that, yeah, yeah. that almost makes it the whole thing worthwhile. Yeah. You know, I'm yeah. certainly glad that we started at the end. And particularly since Ain't Too Proud is coming to Boston yeah. next week. So I, I, I hope people go see the show yeah. and think it'll be grand. Excellent. You know, uh, so, 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 um, so as you mentioned a couple of times already, you moved here I mean, uh, in, in 2008. Where were you right before you moved here? Uh, well, a little, uh, we'd lived in Philadelphia for a oh, while. Yeah. We'd lived in Bernardsville, New Jersey for a while. We, we moved a lot. We moved here from Eaglesmere, Pennsylvania, which is a tiny little resort town on yeah. top of a mountain in north central Pennsylvania. Had 123 year round residents and between two and 3,000 uh, summer residents. We lived there year round. And then from there, I moved up here. And as I said, once I, I moved up here, I just, oh, 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 evolutionary biology. But what brought you here? Um, my late husband had been in business, uh -huh. a business executive, but he'd always wanted to teach. And so he took an early retirement to apply for teaching jobs. And he was hired at uh, UMass Boston as an adjunct professor. And I have a daughter and a son-in-law and a granddaughter in Arlington. And so, you know, it was, it was a no-brainer once he got okay. offered that job. So, so that's, they, they, that's, that's, that's what brought us up here. Okay. But it's the perfect spot for me now. I loved Eaglesmere when I was there. I wrote a book about how much I loved Eaglesmere. Yeah. But um, this is the perfect place for me now. And it just feels like this is so meant to be. I love this area. Love, well, love, love Arlington. Well, well that, that, of course, that warms my heart because, you know, the, I have a, a, a little, nice little role in the town. So, so it's good to hear that you like the town. Do you know what made your, your you said you have a daughter, mm -hmm. a son-in-law and a grandson? I, so, a grand, I, I, here in Arlington, yeah. I have a daughter, a son-in-law yeah. and a granddaughter, yeah. a granddaughter who's now in her first year right. at UNH. Yeah. But, you know what made them come to Arlington? Yeah, my daughter uh, went to BU. She rode for yeah. BU, you know, she was, and, and she fell in love with Boston. Yeah. And so she was very eager to come back. She stayed, actually, and worked in Boston after she graduated, then moved to Philadelphia, where she met the man she's now married to. Yeah. And when John was looking for a job, they, they focused in on Boston, the Boston area. Yeah, gotcha. And, and they love it, too. All right. Yeah. Gotcha. Uh, so, oh, okay, now I remember the question. And this will probably be the, the last question. So you've written more than one book. Yes. Apparently. Yes. You know, um, how many? I, well, I can tell you, I, <laughs> I've written many more than I've had published. Yeah. And I can't stop writing. But the three that have been commercially published are this one, What Sex Got to Do With It. My first book was called Sexual Selection. I'd called it Female Choice, Darwin's Theory of Female Choice and Sexual Selection. My publisher at E.P. Dutton changed it to sexual choice, 
cleverly figuring out that a book with sex in the title would, right. would get me on all the talk shows, which it did. So that was my first book. I turned my dissertation into a trade book is essentially what I did. But my original editor, not E.P. Dutton, but a small uh, publisher had purchased it first and then sold it to E.P. Dutton. They edited out all the theory. And so that was left, you know, I didn't have my evolutionary theory in there, my challenges to Darwin, my update of Darwin. So that was the first book, Sexual Choice. And then I tried to write some books in, on economics because I began to really see the connection between sexual selection and economic behavior. I d did not get them published. Uh, then I was diagnosed with a very, very serious cancer, and I thought, wow, if I'm going to write books, you know, I better quit having so much fun in life, and, and, you know, time is, I might not have time. And so that, I wrote a book called February Light, which was a memoir about the, the cancer years, and uh, St. Martin's Press published that one. So I have only three that have been commercially published. I worked for someone who did... Um, sort of life histories of people and converted them to books. So I did that kind of ghost writing for that gentleman and then on my own. But if I count them up, I've written 13 books. Well, <laughs> and I've really only had three commercially published. I don't totally count the ones that I did, uh, you know, as a ghost writer. But, right, right, but, right. but three under my own name. But yeah, I've written 13. I should, right. probably shouldn't admit to that. Oh no no that's no no I think that's I think that's great I mean personally so so you take so how many were ghost written Well the one that was ghost written uh. that that almost you know became commercially published that was the only complete book the others were you know the kinds of things where someone tells their life story and then they just want a book for their family members. That's what those. That's what you. theirs, what theirs were. But 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 th those that would deal with interesting, as I consider it, the intellectual material. How many of those were unpublished? Well, because I was having trouble getting, it it is hard to challenge Darwin. Yeah. If people assume that I'm not a you know not right. interested in science. Right. And so I was having a lot of trouble when I would pitch nonfiction books. So I thought, I'll put these ideas in fiction books. I'll sell them that way. Uh, so I wrote a trilogy that had many of my ideas about evolution, sexual selection, and economics in that. That was a fantasy trilogy. Yeah. I don't even read fantasy. Well. The arrogance of writing that is hysterical. So I didn't get that published. And then I've... Since I've been in Boston before I wrote this book, um, I wrote a uh, near future science fiction that has a lot of my ideas. Uh, my my nonfiction ideas disguised as fiction, which is not a good idea. But but those books, those four, the four attempts at fiction, I'm still very close to. The nonfiction books, you know, one I called Out of England, and you know, but I don't think they were so great. <laughs> well, the fiction ones though sound sound interesting, you know. So, uh, and, and, and I'm intrigued. So, the re whole reason I'm driving at this is, is to say, have you considered making them available electronically? Like, you know, you don't need to. You don't need to go through a publisher now, unless maybe you're thinking about still having them published. I mean, but I'm getting at it because I mean, I would love to read them. Yeah, yeah, Lynn, I, you are a brute for punishment. Yeah. You really are. I, I, when I first met you, and you said you were interested in in seeing the cover design on my book, we never, you know, we were both attending a Zoom meeting, oh, and you heard me offering it to yeah, show it yeah. to some of my buddies in, on the committee. And you said, oh, I'd like to see that too, Heather. And I, we chatted a bit before yeah. the meeting. Mm -hmm. I was, oh, oh, this man understands evolutionary biology. Yeah. Yeah. He understands genetics. Yeah. And so, you know, you read it in manuscript form. Yeah. Um, so uh, in terms of the fiction books, I'm such a dreamer. I think, well, wow, if what sex got to do with it would become yeah. a big book, Maybe someone would be interested in publishing uh, my fantasy trilogy because the same ideas are in there. I wrote that so long ago, and I look at it, I predicted so many of the things that have happened in terms of our 
politics and emphasis on oh. wall building and, and uh, oh. so many of those things oh. that have since come to pass. You have got to get it published. You've got to get it published. <laughs> you know? and, so, and, 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 and what I'm hoping is that in the attempt mm -hmm. to try to get it published, mm -hmm. I will get to be like one of your proofreaders because I, I, I just really, I'm not a fantasy person either, but knowing where your whole like book is going you know, and the concepts in it, especially the economic stuff. And now what you've told me about it predicted, because you know, to me, essentially prediction, I, I find it's not like I'm like a psychic and I, yeah. I feel the future. It's more like you just kind of like to say, okay, well, you have you start here and sequentially, where do things go? I mean, <laughs> what, and probabilistically, you're not saying like I'm predicting it, but like yeah. probabilistically, this is what could happen. You but, know, so, yeah, uh, I, I go uh, back and I, I anticipated a lot of the environmental concerns uh, that that we have now. But, you know, Len, I wrote these thinking it was probably young adult. Uh, there's a romance, you uh -huh. know, that's the romance that drives the story. So it's kind of aiming at, at a young adult that's female fun. audience. I, d I don't know, but... Oh, you're saying that I probably wouldn't be interested. I don't know. Yeah. I, I don't know if you would be or not. Uh -huh. Because, you know, I kind of bury the economic ideas. They're right. in there for me. Right, 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 right. And my feeling was, oh, I would hope that when young people would be yeah. finished reading that they would think, wait, why couldn't that work for us now? Right, and why right. couldn't we have that kind of a solution yeah. that would give us economic yeah. equality and would save the environment? Yeah. Why? Because those were the two things I was concerned about even right, then. Right, right, right. That was like 15 years ago. Yeah. I'm still concerned yeah. about well, economic equality, inequality yeah. and, and well, the environment. Well, even if I, it wouldn't appeal to me because I'm not the demographic, and I'm fine with that. You know, I will say that one of the things I've been working on in town here is getting a youth and young adult advisory board meeting for the town. Meeting. And hopefully in this session of town meeting, we're going to vote that in. It will be called the Young Arlington Collaborative. And the whole premise of it is to get youth and young adults in town really thinking about I mean, how their government can work for them, getting them more involved in their local government. And so, and so I, mean, I mean, a lot of them have ideas along these lines anyways. And I think it would be great for them to be exposed to that more, if not through fiction, then, you know, then through direct just, just the idea of following your passion. Yeah. You know, doing, we all have things that I think we all do. Dream something we believe in. Right. An idea that gets us out of bed in the morning. Yeah. I want to bring this to pass. I think I, I have an answer to something. Yeah. I, I, I want to have my voice heard. Yeah. And encouraging young people to believe in themselves. Yeah. I think that's really important. Yeah. Yeah, because they, they are the future, and I certainly remember how uh, how much I valued having adults me just listen to me and interact with me, and I think mm -hmm. that's what being, um, what's his name? James? James Tyrone James, Lane. Yeah, now yeah. he called, when he was little, uh, I call him Roni, yeah. I, for Tyrone. He went yeah. by Tyrone when yeah. he was a little guy. Yeah. And I asked him when we were talking on the phone the other day, I said, how would I even spell Roni? Because yeah. I am a bit dyslexic. Yeah. He said, however you want to spell it. Yeah. After. I said, well, do you mind if I, because when I'm feeling real affectionate, toward him, I'll say, oh, Roni, that's exciting. Yeah. Like, do, you, do you mind? Because my daughter will sometimes say to me, mom, he goes by James now. Yeah. I said, yeah, but I knew him when he right. was Tyrone. Right. And funny when I was growing up, too, I went by Tyrone, too. That, Did you? Because my mom gave me that. That was her favorite name for me. My first name is Len, as in Leonard. So we are way out of time. <laughs>